Um, our next speaker um, is Dr. Olwen Han. Uh, Dr. Olwen Han is a faculty scholar at the Buxbaum Institute, an assistant professor of medicine in the hematology oncology section, and her area of interest and specialization is the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. Uh, Olwen is a dedicated teacher who teaches medical students, residents, and fellows on the effect of communication between doctors and patients. Her talk today, uh, as you see uh, behind me, is communication skills training for oncology trainees. Welcome, Olwen. Thank you for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak. And so, as Dr. Siegler says, I come from um, to this topic as a medical oncologist who's interested in improving the patient-doctor relationship, but also as the associate program director for the Hematology Oncology Fellowship, where I'm interested in training our um, fellows to become good communicators. And I think Dr. Ubel's talk did a great introduction to the landscape of this. There's a lot of um, articles in the press recently about what a poor job physicians are doing in communicating. And in fact, we should maybe be doing less talking and more listening to our patients. And I think all this is part of a larger national conversation that has been going on also about the end-of-life care of patients. Dr. Gawande eloquently put in his book, Being Mortal, that when having end-of-life conversations with patients that are terminally ill, we are doing it the wrong way. Instead of eliciting patients' concerns about their illness, how they want to spend their time, and how what concerns would be, um, outcomes would be detrimental to them, we're giving them more technical information about our therapeutics and their risk and benefits. As well as um, the Institute of, Merrick of a, the Institute of Medicine um, published a report in 2014 of dying in America, and it kind of highlights the poor job we are doing in advanced care planning for our patients with terminal illnesses. And it made several specific recommendations about what we should be doing and how we should be educating physicians to have end-of-life conversations and then participate in advanced care planning. And so, as Dr. Ubel stated, the deficits in um, uh, physicians' communication is pretty well documented. And even um, learned through Dr. Siegler's patient doctor's course, as early in the 1900s, there had been um, reports in the literature about the demise of the patient-doctor relationship. But in the oncology literature, there's a lot to be said that physicians, we are talking too much, that we're not exploring patients' values, and that patients are not understanding the information that we are providing them. And I think Tony Bach, who is the developer of Oncotalk series, which is a, an experiential workshop to teach communication skills, puts it best. The way you communicate with patients is part of your work as a healer. You are not born with communication skills. You cultivate them. And Dr. Bach and his colleagues, when they write a lot about teaching communication skills, they kind of draw nice parallels between teaching communication skills as one would teach a resident to become a surgeon. That these are not skills that you observe and watch a witty lecture. These are skills that you practice, you get feedback, and it's a reiterative process until you achieve mastery. There have been several reports published about the efficacy of communication skills training. This is the Oncotalk program that Dr. Bach and his colleagues led. Dr. Fallowfield from the UK published that the um, oncologists can be trained in communication skills and that the 12-month period after the intervention that they are able to attain, um, they attain these um, communication skills and they do not demise over that period of time. And most recently, a publication was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that radiation therapy teams, so these are interprofessional teams of nurses, physicians, radiation therapists, they were randomized to either be trained communication skills or be placed on a wait list for communication skills training. And those physicians that received the immediate training, they improved their communication skills but additionally, the patients tr treated by them had improved satisfaction versus the patients that were uh, treated by the teams that were on the waiting list. So how are we doing as an education community? community? Well, not as well as we should be. Um, Dr. Doherty's and Halbaki here at University of Chicago did a survey of ASCO oncologists and revealed that 42% of them received communication skills training at a variety of points of um, their education. And then the early 
to, um, 2000s, Dr. Bale from the Oncotalk faculty, he did a survey of program directors, and he learned that only about one-third of programs contained some sort of communication skills training. Surgery programs were particularly lacking in this respect. We, um, not only is teaching communication skills important in order to develop our clinicians to be um, good physicians, but there also we have an educational mandate for such. The ACGME states that communication skills need to include skills practice and feedback. And the internal ABIM, their internal medicine milestones for both residents as well as subspecialists include many um, of the milestones include communication skills um, as part of the competencies that we need to be rating our trainees on. And so as part of this, um, a group of us, um, kind of a multidisciplinary group of us led by Dan Golden of Radiation Oncology and his residence, Dr. Akhtar, put together a survey where we surveyed both program directors as well as trainees. And the goal of the survey was to look at interdisciplinary education across all the multiple disciplines in oncology. We sent the survey to uh, 400, um, 740 programs, and it kind of spanned medical oncology, pediatric, all of the surgical specialties, radiation, as well as included the hospice and palliative care. And so our crude response rate in terms of trainees was about 34%, and for program directors was 19%. So that is one of the limitations of this survey, is that um, it is a limited sample. But you see here is a diagram of who responded, um, kind of driven by adult hemonc, surgical hemonc, and radiation oncology. But the findings are interesting. So 44% of trainees report that they receive some sort of communication skills training. However, 67% of program directors report that communication skills was part of their training program. And, and another interesting thing is in terms of the type of communication, most of it is lecture or workshop base. Um, fortunately, both the trainees and the program directors recognized that standardized patients were being used at the same percentage. But in terms of faculty feedback, there was other, another statistically um, significant difference that, um, that between a, a difference between what the program directors think is going on and what the trainees are experiencing. And so this is a breakdown of communication skills by specialty. And not surprisingly, our hospice and palliative care um, uh, colleagues are doing an excellent job of communi um, incorporating communication skills in their uh, training programs, whereas our more oncology-specific adults and surgicals were less than 50%. And then again, when you look at how the specific programs are incorporating communication um, skills, you see it's primarily lecture, workshop base, as well as some faculty feedback. Um, and again, a higher percentage in our hospice and um, palliative care. We asked them about what was the perceived usefulness of communication skills training. And program directors rated a higher, um, higher rate of usefulness than trainees. But some of the, um, the written comments showed this big dichotomy. For among the trainees, there were some people that found communication skills to be very useful. That this is um, one of the things that the most useful things they had in their training course, that maybe their attendings would benefit as well. How others were a little bit more skeptical. This would be a total waste of time. And if you don't have communication skills by this point, you better abandon the specialty. They also some identified some barriers in terms of time constraints with clinical demands, as well as they're not sure who would be able to um, support that type of curriculum at their institution. And same thing with the program directors. Some of them thought it was of importance. They had developed very rich programs in communication training. Others could not do this so because of financial constraints or just a perceived lack they did not need it in their program. So what are we doing at the University of Chicago? Well, um, since 2010, we have a collaborative interprofessional team led by Faye Halbaki, who is a clinical psychologist and an expert in communication skills. And we've set up a core curriculum for our fellows. So some of the objectives is to teach the fellows the body of research about effective communication strategies, have them acquire cognitive robots, as well as be able to demonstrate and practice communication skills. And this is a lot based on the published Ogden Talk methods. And so this is kind of sub, some of the courses or the sessions that our fellows see. And we've received very positive feedback. 
But there's one, been one kind of missing piece. And when you look at kind of Kirkpatrick's triangle for ed, um, education, we are doing a good job in terms of satisfaction and skill a acquisition. But a, the, assessing the transfer of these skills into the workplace is kind of a missing piece at this time. That our fellows' communication skills are kind of evaluated by the faculty in aggregate at the end of the rotation. And as somebody who sits on the clinical competency committee every six months, we kind of have a dearth, as a national conversation, we really have a dearth of kind of really specifics on the skills and, and data to which to be able to say whether our fellows are competent or not. And we think that the direct observation with formative feedback is highly variable. And we all know the barriers. We have a lot to teach the fellows. We have a crowded clinical education curriculum. There are real time constraints in the clinic and pressures to be clinically efficient. And there's also a question, if you're going to observe the fellow, what skills should you be evaluating? So we've been thinking long and hard about how to implement this for the trainees. And a lot of it is, you know, ideally we recognize that direct observation feedback should be a part of all clinical experiences with the fellow. And rotations, but there's some kind of real logistical concerns of how to implement this. And kind of fortunately, um, the hospital and our section led by Dr. Doherty have established a supportive oncology unit. And the nice thing about this is this unit's on Mitchell and it's focused on patients that need a meaningful transition to palliative care or exclusively palliative care. And this is a truly interdisciplinary team that rounds. It includes a hemonc attending, a palliative care attending, who as we data show are doing a good job of being trained and are um, training their colleagues in communication skills. And so that was one of the services that we thought would be a great place to implement direct observation. The other natural fit would, is the HEMONC um, consult service. As those patients, we have newly diagnosed patients with cancer, as well as patients in the ICU. And so what, um, what I did is I kind of created a direct observation and feedback form. And I got this idea from a program director's meeting um, based on University of um, Wisconsin and Madison um, that their program has been using this for all um, direct observation for many types of skills. And it's based on Google Docs. It's a quick document that can be filled out. Um, and it um, kind of uh, emphasizes skills that we want to make sure that the fellow is acquiring. Is the fellow properly prepared? Did the fellow inquire about patient's perception? As well as, do they use um, empathetic statements? What is the skill level of the, as a resident? And then some quick comments about what went well and what could have gone better. And so the nice thing about this is that what we've been, been doing for the uh, past month is that each um, block, we've been emailing the uh, trainees as well as the attendings. And the emphasis is really not necessarily on the form, but on the direct observation experience um, and then giving the immediate formative feedback. But the nice thing about this is that it's quick, it's easily accessible, we can use our smartphones for it. The form prompts the faculty for what skills should be evaluated. And can I can give the faculty some a guide for them to observe the fellow as well as to provide verbal feedback. And so again, the emphasis is on the act of observation and the feedback. But from a program director standpoint, the form provides documentation that this is happening as well as being able to find out what a particular fellow's skill level is. And so from a trainee st standpoint, they are being able to get immediate feedback and direct observation from a real-time encounter. As well as for the, our trainees, our first years on the supportive oncology unit, they get interdisciplinary input. The palliative care faculty can be a key part of um, observing them and training them in um, communication skills. And one of the nice thing about Google Docs is that you can get some aggregate um, information about, you know, kind of over uh, several evaluations how this can be done. And so right now we're in a six month pilot period. We're gonna evaluate you know, percentage of forms complete and we're collecting um, feedback from both the faculty and fellows on the process. And if successful, we can expand it into the ambulatory setting. As well as, um, we're going to do an assessment of the faculty and fellows in the HEMOC se um, section. Um, Dr. Cohen and I, for the first time, we've developed a survey of the faculty to look at all aspects of our training program, including how well we're doing in communication skills. And so we received one um, feedback from one of the um, clinical masters in our program. And I think it kind of highlights one of the things that we're hoping to achieve. It is hard as an experienced conductor of family meetings for me to sit quietly and listen to someone else explain things in slightly different ways than I would. 
maybe it's a good learning experience for me as a preceptor. And so I think this highlights that we want this to be good for the trainee, but also as, as a way to remind us as faculty how we should be doing our job and training the fellows. And so I just wanted to acknowledge um, the Buxbaum Institute, as well as the educational man mandates that are going on for communication skills, that having a, the Buxbaum Institute at University of Chicago fosters in a good environment that this can be um, come interwoven into what we're trying to teach our fellows. And thank you very much. Any questions? All right. John, um, I wonder if you'd consider expanding that teaching beyond the Hemong Fellows uh, to, to residents or to medical students. Mm -hmm. um, the the direct observation or or. Um, so I think this is definitely something, um, you know, as Onco Talk has kind of expanded into Nephro Talk and ICU Talk, yes. I think, you know, there are definitely things that are very specific to oncology, but definitely can be easily expanded into other programs and is very relevant and can be tailored, as well as kind of the ability to use the form as a tool for direct observation. Yes. 